Assalamualaikum everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Palvasha Amjad and I'm an associate at the UNDP's uh, Merged Areas Governance Project and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, I have a few quick announcements before we begin. Uh, we are currently live on the Health Department's uh, Facebook page for which I would like to thank the Health Department of KP for allowing us to go live on their social media page. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we are in the Zoom webinar mode rather than a regular online meeting. Hence, as attendees, uh, everyone's cameras and mics are off. Uh, we will, of course, have a Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to type your questions in the question answer tab in front of your screen anytime during the webinar. We will get to it after our speakers and discussants have spoken. Uh, our Facebook audience can also share their questions in the comment section and we will try to get to them. Please do mention your name and organization with your position. Once the webinar ends, uh, you will see a survey about the event. Please do take your, uh, the time out to fill out uh, the survey. All right, now for that, uh, without further ado, let us begin the session. Um, I am so glad uh, that we have such uh, esteemed uh, participants today, esteemed uh, experts on our panel. Uh, and I would like to thank them uh, for taking out the time today to attend UNDP's ongoing webinar series, Merged Areas Reforms Policy Series. UNDP's Merged Areas Governance Project, MAGP, supports the government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, providing technical assistance to policy making in critical areas such as health, uh, the government has prioritized uh, the health sector in the merged areas. However, the region continues to struggle with poor health outcomes. In this regard, our ongoing merged areas reforms policy series aims to invite discussion around such key current development themes informed by, by global practice and knowledge. Uh, the fourth webinar in the series attempts to assess the access to maternal health care interventions and how the barriers could be overcome through possible IT-based initiatives. I have the immense pleasure of introducing Dr. Zlatko Nikoloski as our speaker today. Dr. Zlatko is an Assistant Professorial Research Fellow at LSE's Department of Health Policy. He has earned his PhD and Master's from the University College London and the John Hopkins University, respectively. As a development economist, Dr. Nikoloski's work focuses on universal healthcare coverage and out-of-pocket healthcare payments. Access to focuses on universal healthcare, access to child maternal healthcare, sorry, interventions, as well as risk factors, and the economic burden of non-communicable diseases. He has also significantly contributed to our own UNDP, MAGP project around issues of poverty and access to health. Drawing on his expertise and the topic of today's seminar, Dr. Nikoloski uh, attempts to answer the question of what does it take to extend quality service delivery to remote areas in a low resource environment? Uh, Dr. Uh, Nikoloski, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, so, um, Again, my name is Atko Nikolsky. I'm a research fellow at LSE. It's, it's a deep, deep joy to be here and to guide you through some of the work that I've done in the area of access to healthcare, barriers to access to healthcare, uh, and what it takes to actually uh, circumnavigate around those barriers and improve uh, seamless access to healthcare, particularly um, uh, for maternal health interventions. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So just to uh, anchor our talk today, <clears throat> as you probably all of you know, uh, it's nice to actually start from the Sustainable Development Goals. As we know, the targets 3.1 and 3.2 call for significant reduction of uh, maternal and child mortality across the globe, and in particular in low and middle income countries. Um, 
there is significant research that has been done on the determinants of uh, maternal um, and child mortality and uh, among other things we've done quite a lot of work uh, relational analysis based on the mix in DHS uh, data sets and we found that there are a lot of factors or a few sort of policy relevant factors that um, uh, uh, sort of further reduce uh, or are correlated with further reduction in maternal and child mortality. Uh, one of those is essentially uh, ensuring timely access to adequate healthcare, which is um, uh, proxied by uh, uh, skilled medical birth assistance. Um, in fact, skilled medical birth assistance is one of the core SDG indicators, as we know from the targets, uh, the target 3.1.1 essentially um, calls for increase in, the, uh, in uh, skilled birth assistance during delivery. Uh, it's an, it, obviously, this uh, uh, will further lead to improvement in child and maternal healthcare, uh, healthcare outcomes in low and middle income countries, as we've seen from the research. Uh, despite all of this research, however, and despite all of this uh, uh, knowledge that we have about factors, and particularly policy relevant factors that facilitate access to timely and adequate healthcare, um, maternal and child health outcomes in the merged areas uh, are still fairly low, and they're really lagging behind the rest of the provinces in Pakistan. So, in this presentation, we'll try to see. Um, uh, first, what are those barriers? Uh, mostly from building on the international literature, some of some of which we've done ourselves. And second, to see some of the um, some of the interventions again emerging from the literature, which can help uh, uh, facilitate the access to timely and adequate healthcare, and then ultimately improving um, improve uh, child and maternal um, health outcomes. Next slide, please. So uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about the papers, uh, some of the work that we've done at LSE uh, on access to uh, key maternal healthcare services in low and middle income countries. Uh, so we've done uh, a lot of work in this area across uh, different regions and across different countries, mostly low and middle income countries. And the sort of the main message that stems from all of this research is that access to uh, the key maternal healthcare services in low and middle income countries remains significantly pro rich. Um, in the first paper, which we published in 2018 in the International Journal of Equity Healthcare, we looked at coverage uh, and equity of access to four key maternal healthcare interventions, uh, skilled birth assistance, C-section, antenatal and postnatal care in two countries in Latin America, Brazil and Colombia, who are at a different stage of um, uh, reaching universal healthcare coverage. Um, what we do find is that for all of these interventions uh, across the two countries, they are marked by significant inequities in access. Uh, it, more specifically, just to, re to reiterate the message again, access to these uh, interventions remains pro rich uh, in both countries. Most recently, uh, with colleagues from the regional office of UNICEF in, in uh, Jordan, uh, we've conducted a similar analysis uh, on um, access to key maternal and child health relevant interventions in 13 countries of the wider Middle East and North Africa regions, all the way from Morocco to Yemen, essentially relying on 29 surveys. So these are the standard DHS and mix surveys. So we've taken a look at uh, services delivered at uh, primary healthcare level, but also at secondary. I'm sorry, I just wasn't finished with the <laughs> Uh, and also at secondary uh, uh, level of healthcare. And what we do find is that uh, there has been an increase in coverage of selected interventions, uh, particularly those which are delivered in primary healthcare setting. But again, we find a significant pro-rich inequities of access. More importantly, uh, when it comes to delivery uh, uh, interventions delivered at secondary care, we do uh, we do find a significant fragmentation of the healthcare system, where the rich gravitate towards the private healthcare services and the poor towards the public ones. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, in addition to looking at uh, access and the level of equity of access and who has a better access, whether the rich or the poor. Uh, it, with this research that we've done uh, in both papers, uh, we've also looked into uh, the reasons behind why there is such a pronounced pro rich inequity in access of the selected services. And again, we follow the standard methodological approach of decomposition of the concentration index. Um, and um, 
the findings based on the based on the DHS mix uh, data suggest that there are a handful of variables which are common uh, uh, common barriers uh, of access uh, to the, to the selected healthcare services. So. Just to enumerate some of them, wealth obviously that uh, uh, is consistently contributing with the highest share in the overall inequity in access. The education attainment of a woman of a mother or a mother, depending whether the service relates to the woman itself or to the child, um, is also contributing to increase in equity in access. And what we do suggest from our research is that this is usually a proxy for awareness or demand for selected healthcare intervention. Sadly, the DHS and mixed surveys do not really have anything in terms of availability of healthcare infrastructure, but there is a, a dummy variable there which uh, captures the rural urban gap. And also this could be a proxy for availability of healthcare infrastructure. And what we do find that uh, the level of urbanization, availability of healthcare services or healthcare infrastructure overall in urban areas uh, further increase the inequity in access. Um, well, importantly, uh, and this is only for the case of Brazil, because there was also there, there was only this variable available in that DHS survey, is that social protection mechanism actually reduce inequity in access. So in Brazil, as you might be aware, there is the Bolsa Familia uh, conditional cash transfers uh, program. So what we do find that women enrolled in the program actually uh, marked a, a much better access uh, to the selected services. So in addition to uh, so protecting the poor directly, we can see that these social protection mechanisms have also spillover effects on, uh, on facilitating access to healthcare, obviously by you know reducing um, cost of transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sadly, um, there is the, we are limited. One of the limitations of this uh, studies is that they are based on surveys which only uh, uh, contain so many variables. So uh, we can only um, um, include the ones that I mentioned before in the analysis, but from the rest of the literature, we do find evidence that particularly this is the quality that uh, additional factors are associated with uh, uh, lack of timely access to healthcare, such as, for example, cultural. The fact that there are only so many uh, factors we can get from the available um, surveys and there are additional ones stemming from the qualitative research and essentially this is these are related to anthropological, cultural, logical factors, um, uh, factors related to quality of care, etc. We so from the from the literature, as we saw from the from the previous slide, there are significant uh, barriers to access to selected healthcare interventions, particularly those uh, in uh, those relevant to maternal health. And uh, uh, there, from the literature, what we do know now is that, uh, or what the current literature shows is there are certain ways, uh, particularly those relevant to low and middle income countries, uh, to circumnavigate around some of these barriers so, uh, of access. And the use of IT, particularly mobile phone, has recently been hailed as a, as a very promising area uh, and cost-effective area in further improving access uh, and therefore improving uh, quality of um, 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 uh, quality of care as well as uh, uh, overall sort of improvement in in maternal and child uh, health outcomes in low and middle income countries. Um, as I said, this is because the use of mobile telephony has improved uh, has increased uh, because it's a cost effective way of communication. They've been also used as a payment tool, uh, and there is a plethora of evidence on this building on the Intensa uh, in Kenya. But also, as we as we know, and we're going to discuss this in, in a little bit uh, uh, from the literature, they are increasingly used as a tool for communicating the importance of health lifestyle, so essentially increasing the uh, health literacy, particularly among mothers as well as circumnavigating around some of these barriers associated with a fractured referral system, which we mentioned before. So I just wanted to turn your attention to the literature on the use of mobile telephonies in improving access to maternal health. And that's a, that, uh, the uh, burgeoning evidence or burgeoning literature is actually divided in two major strands. One is focusing on the targeting of women themselves, and the second one is focusing on targeting of the healthcare providers. So next slide, please. Um, 
Uh, so there are three actually uh, uh, literature reviews that uh, uh, have covered the use of SMS, uh, text messages, and also widely the use of IT in directly targeting pregnant women. The one, uh, the most comprehensive one is the one from Wagner et al. So that's the one that you see on the left hand side, which was done in 2018. And essentially the literature review is encompassing seven randomized control uh, trials, uh, encompassing roughly uh, 8,324 participants. Um, it's only seven RCTs because, as I said, this is a very novel area. So, the, the, so when they did the literature, the obviously so these were the only studies that were available. But as I uh, mentioned before, it's a burgeoning area. So there are uh, new studies, new RCTs coming up um, every year. What they do find after they do the literature review, they also conduct a meta-analysis and then from their findings, it's, uh, the findings are quite unequivocal in fact. What they do find is that the use of SMS uh, messages or uh, IT more generally directly targeting pregnant women is associated with 174% increase in focused antenatal care and 82% increase in skilled birth assistance. Um, similar evidence is found from the literature review by Colacci et al, uh, um, which was done in 2017. Um, in particular, uh, what they find is that uh, SMS or text messages are particularly helpful in reaching women at risk, so teenage girls or women in remote areas. And this is actually quite important uh, for the merged areas, uh, as we know, and Dr. Hasn is going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, remoteness is one of the key barriers uh, to access in this in this region. Um, Pharaohs at all again uh, include uh, most of the studies in this in their literature review, which have been covered by the previous two. Um, in addition, they actually cast their net a bit wider in a sense that they are looking at, at additional uh, sort of use of IT, uh, such as for example like electronic health records, uh, etc. But Overall, what they do find is that uh, the area which uses IT or SMS messages to target pregnant women is the one where most of the knowledge currently is based, whereas all the other ones of the use of IT are not as uh, um, researched. Uh, and again, um, their, their sort of conclusion from the review that they do is that interventions delivered through SMS associated with improved utilization of preventative maternal health care services, including uptake of recommended antenatal care and postnatal care. So the takeaway message from this slide is that the use of mobile telephony in directly targeting pregnant women uh, is associated with uh, improvement in health literacy and obviously increase in access uh, to the selected healthcare interventions. Next slide, please. Um, what is important is that uh, there is a significant overlap in all of these literature reviews that I mentioned before, in a sense that they include uh, the studies are coming up uh, over and over again. That's obviously because of the limited number of studies. But there is one which has been consistent, or a couple rather, which have been consistently included in all of them because of the high quality of evidence that they produce. And this is the study based, uh, uh, it's co-authored by the same group of authors led by Lund. Um, it's a study which is based on Zanzibar, semi-autonomous island in Tanzania. Essentially, it's a cluster randomized control study uh, covering 2,500 women at 24 facilities in Zanzibar. And the intervention consists of uh, two parts. The first one is uh, sending text messages to women, uh, improving their health literacy. And the second one is actually providing them with uh, telephonic voucher where they, upon redeeming, they can actually establish a two-way communication between uh, the healthcare provider and obviously ask questions about their pregnancy and everything they're concerned with. Um, what they do find is that from the, their original study, uh, that was the one published in 2012, is that obviously there is an improvement that the use of this particular intervention, combination of the two uh, uh, sections of the intervention, is associated with improvement in uh, uh, skilled birth assistance, essentially 60% uh, versus 47 in the control group. However, they only find the evidence for the urban uh, participants. Um, as an aside, they also do a second study because obviously they um, 
uh, in the service that they conduct uh, uh, through the intervention. They cover other interventions as well. Um, and what they do see is that uh, the use of uh, uh, SMS uh, to uh, text messages to target women uh, with health literacy and also establish this two-way communication with healthcare provider is associated with uh, increase of access in other interventions, such as, for example, antenatal care. Uh, and we do see that, that there is a 44% versus 31 in the control group of uptake of the antenatal care. And finally, they do see a lower perinatal mortality as well. So there are all of these additional asides that come up from, from the interventions that they, that they do. Ultimately, the bottom line from this slide, again, is that there is a, a really promising uh, role that IT, that the use of uh, uh, text messages, mobile telephony can have. Uh, in informing women and establishing two-way communication with the healthcare providers, ultimately leading to improvement in access to uh, selected interventions. Next slide, please. Um, there are also, uh, I, I mentioned a couple of slides ago that there is a second strand of the literature, uh, which is actually using of mobile telephony text messages to target healthcare workers. and. Uh, there are um, various ways that the use of mobile telephony can actually be used in, in, in um, improving communication um, between healthcare workers, such as, for example, speed up the referral system, report emergency, uh, confirm meetings, or ask for general information. Um, as I mentioned before, unlike the previous area uh, targeting women uh, directly, this area hasn't really received that much uh, uh, attention and there are just a handful of studies that uh, uh, are available and which have looked at uh, the use of mobile telephony in, in targeting healthcare workers. So the first one, uh, just quickly, uh, it's essentially use of mobile phones to reduce the communication gaps between healthcare workers and the district teams in Malawi. The second one is based in Rwanda and essentially is, uh, is establishing this use of SMS messages to establish a two-way communication between community healthcare workers and the rest of the healthcare system, either ambulance, uh, healthcare, health facility staff, a district hospital, uh, and essentially this led to uh, a much better referral system and um, a reduction in maternal and child deaths uh, in the selected districts where they conducted the intervention. Um, the final one, which was published by the Bulletin of World Health Organization, essentially uh, entailed use of text messaging for transmission of test results between healthcare facility and caregivers and uh, in order to reduce the time needed for a diagnosis of um, infant HIV infection in Zambia and, and putting that, uh, that infant on a, a ART as soon as possible. So the, these studies, again, similarly to the previous strand, unequivoc unequivocally, um, suggest that IT can also uh, uh, lead to uh, or be used to improve communication between healthcare workers, again, leading to better access uh, and better quality uh, to healthcare. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, uh, in addition to IT, uh, and uh, that's also something that has been done in low and middle income countries, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, to uh, um, improvement of health literacy is the role of human resources for health, particularly community healthcare workers in improving health literacy for pregnant women. Um, so uh, in addition to the use of mobile telephony, this intervention can also be quite promising. It's, it's a bit more traditional, but it's a, a bit more promising in promoting health literacy. Uh, uh, and by doing that, increasing the uptake of uh, use of healthcare, such as, for example, antenatal care and skill birth assistance. There are a couple of studies uh, available on this uh, on this topic. Uh, both of them conducted in um, uh, in the context of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they are pre-post studies, uh, uh, similarly to the randomized controlled trials that we've seen before. Um, and essentially what they've entailed is uh, they entail community healthcare workers who are trained to provide educational and referral services to mothers regarding safe motherhood. Um, and they, in both studies, uh, uh, the use of this uh, method of the, you know, community healthcare workers as promoters of, of health literacy was associated in, in improvement in ANC, in ANC, antenatal care attendance as well as skilled delivery. And then ultimately, obviously, that results with uh, much better maternal and child health outcomes. 
and the final slide. Um, so uh, just the final slide, uh, just as a sort of a, uh, to wrap up uh, all of this material that I've thrown onto you over the last few minutes. Um, access to healthcare interventions, particularly those relevant to maternal health, uh, remains pro-rich across most of the low, or pretty much all uh, low and middle income countries. And that this is what we've seen from our own research. From our own research, we've also seen that there are a few barriers that explains this. That explain this. This is a, a encompassing socioeconomic status, availability of healthcare facility, transport links, uh, female literacy as a proxy for empowerment, um, the fractured referral system, and so on. However, also from the literature that I've presented uh, in this talk over the last few minutes, we see that there are a few ways of circumnavigating around these barriers and ensuring a seamless access to healthcare. Uh, particularly those relevant to maternal health. Um, IT, as we saw, the use of mobile telephony could play a significant role in reducing the barriers, um, either by uh, targeting uh, women directly or community healthcare workers who provide uh, healthcare providers or um, um, uh, health resources for health. Uh, in addition uh, to mobile telephony, the community healthcare workers could be particularly useful uh, in a more traditional area uh, in further facilitating access to relevant interventions, such as, for example, improving health literacy and so on. So thank you very much. And I'll stop here and I'll give the floor to Dr. Hasna. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nikolovsky. Um, we are now going to uh, move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Razna Khalid, who has over 20 years of experience working with development organizations, international donor agencies and governments. She is a senior technical advisor with the MAGP and currently serves as the advisor of public health emergencies at the NDMA and the Prime Minister's Secretariat. Additionally, she is a healthcare specialist and a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and public health. Dr. Khalid holds an MD degree from Imperial College London and a PhD from the University College London. Dr. Ghazna Khalid will provide the context of the merged areas and discuss the unique challenges and recommendations to extend quality service delivery in the region. Dr. Ghazna, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Palvasha, and thank you for a very generous introduction. Um, Zlatko, a very nice overview and always a very hard act to follow. Um, Asalikum uh, participants, uh, colleagues and friends, I want to uh, spend the next few minutes going over how we can learn from what Zalatko has explained to us in terms of the literature, in terms of the academia, and translate that into actual service delivery. How can we save the lives of women and babies in, in remote areas? How can we actually make that happen? Next slide, please. So we know that um, we have, I think, we need to think about how we can improve maternal and child health across the globe, but especially in in these low middle income countries. And I'm going to be talking specifically about the merged areas, um, which is uh, a region um, bordering Afghanistan, um, difficult geographical terrain um, and access to adequate health care is extremely uh, challenging. Um, um, so we're, we're talking about this region and for those of you who don't know, I've just alluded to the fact that it's the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's, a, it's the crossroads, it is challenging, it's difficult terrain and difficult to access. 5.2 million population in the merged areas, maternal mortality of the merged areas as we know it right now is 376 per 100,000, neonatal mortality is 8.7. So difficult area, how do we fix it? What do we do? And as Zalatko has gone over um, some key areas in the use of information technology, artificial intelligence, and some of you could, and, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, could argue those of you us who've been to the merged areas, how can we do that? There's no, there's no Wi-Fi connectivity, there's no 3G, there's not even any mobile phone reception in some areas, but we can. So next slide, Pilbesha. 
So we look at the major challenges. What 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 is so specific to this area that causes the the disconnect, the fragmentation? So in my experience and my visits to these areas and my working in these areas, lack of human resources for health is the biggest challenge facing this area. There is very little it would be unfair to say no but there's very little limited human resources to run services buildings and equipment are there they look very spanking new they're they're fully equipped but unfortunately there are no people to run the service um and even when people are deployed in the areas um we can't really uh count on them being there because they're just coverage on tick boxes. Um, electricity, most of these areas only have two hours of electricity. Solarization equipment is unable to run anesthetic machines. So we need to think of innovative ways of how to get services confined and community health care because there is no electricity to run anesthetic machines to do cesarean sections. There is also a, a large context of cultural and social norms. It is a unique area and they have their own culture. And the head of the household has phones, maybe the women don't have phones. So they're not able to access messages, they're not able to access their own interaction with social media and educational attainment. So these are the challenges I put out to you and this is what we need to bear in mind when we're delivering a first class service, when we're delivering quality service. And I know that the uh, KP Health Department has been very kind to let us go live on this, um, for, to talk about these challenges. And my um, sincere uh, congratulations to them in the sense that they're trying their best to turn overcome these challenges. Next slide, please. Health service delivery in the merged areas is primary and secondary. There are no tertiary care facilities. Um, primary care services are provided through community-based uh, lady health workers, community health workers, uh, volunteers, uh, community midwives, which are few and far in between. Lady health visitors are stationed in basic health units, so they provide primary health care services, but they're also stationed in secondary care facilities like THQs and DHQs. Um, so we need to find a way where we connect the dots in this area in particular. And Zlatko in his presentation alluded to the use of information technology. This is a perfect uh, breeding ground of how we can redesign service to use use of IT, use of telemedicine, giving primary health care services and allowing women to get quality of care, to get to connect the dots and fix the fractured referral system. Next slide, please. How are we going to, to try and fix this? At secondary care level, the Sehet in Saf card, uh, all of the inhabitants of the merged areas are, uh, are free to avail the Sehet in Saf card, which allows them to have secondary and primary healthcare services. The accelerated ex implementation program to look at recruitment plans for staff. We don't want so I was just saying that we need to think of innovative ways to extend, to make sure that there's enough people that know what they're doing to deliver this healthcare. And that is a simple ask, but it's a challenging ask, bearing in mind the difficulties, the security concerns, getting staff to the merged areas. We need to engage the private sector for under underutilized units or basic health units, primary health units and hospitals. We need direct feeders from Babda for electricity needs. We need to use information technology and there are ways to do it even when there is no 3G and 4G. Uh, we can save data and get areas where there are specific um, connectivity and then transmit information to a central hub and I think 
we can solve the HR issue. We work through COVID and we work through remote working in COVID. There is no reason why we can't use innovative technology and IT, even in this security concerned, um, marginalized area by using information technology. Um, we need to not only deploy staff, but we need to make sure that we have ways to make sure that the staff that we deploy and uh, the lady health workers, the LHVs, know and have the requisite skills to deal with emergencies, but in order to deliver and to care for pregnant women and their children. So I hope that this has given a little overview on what I feel uh, by working on the ground uh, in the merged areas, what I feel are the recommendations and how I feel that academia can be translated into practice. And with that, I will thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Khasna Khaled. Uh, that was quite uh, insightful. Um, I would now like to give the floor to the Honorable Dr. Niaz Mohammed, Director General Health Services, Government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, to provide a unique lens onto the theme of the seminar. Based on Dr. Saud's experience and expertise in the Directorate, we would like him to illustrate the government's commitment to increasing access and improving the quality of healthcare. With a specific focus on the merged areas, he will also share his thoughts on the recommendations made by our experts today. Uh, so, Dr. Saab, over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely thankful for inviting us in such a uh, fantastic discussion in which uh, Dr. Zalko and Dr. Ghazda Khalad has given their presentation. Uh, the actual issues and recommendation which has been shown by Dr. Ghazda Khalad are fantastic and actually these are the problem. The health department, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, after the merger of this area uh, with the provincial government, you know previously it was looked after by the federal government, and uh, now it is the responsibility of provincial government to provide the healthcare services. There are seven district and six FR areas in this uh, much uh, region. The health department uh, realizing that the, there is a very poor standard of healthcare delivery system and specially and focused to the maternal and child health, uh, have taken a lot of initiative under regular ADP programs and accelerated implementation program. Uh, and this, this time there are 38 uh, ADP programs and there are 24 accelerated implementation projects. I'll just uh, elaborate the main features of these ADPs. We are addressing the infrastructure, we are addressing HR deficiency and HR capacity building. We are also addressing the equipment and medicine supply and other supply uh, to improve the healthcare delivery system at all the level. In much area, we don't have, as Dr. Ghazna has mentioned, there is no tertiary hospital. Uh, we have secondary level hospital, we have primary health facilities like uh, community health centers, civil dispensaries, VHUs, RHCs, and then we have category D, the seeded quarter hospital or category C hospital in this area. Under uh, infrastructure improvement, there is a lot of reconstruction and revamping of the primary health system in this area. Uh, and also one uh, PC1 is under approval for revamping of the district headquarter hospital in the seven districts of the March area. We have recruited specialist doctors more than 50, we have uh, positions of 100, but uh, we could not find, we are relaxing some of the contractual conditions. So we will be able to provide, now we have provided 50 specialist doctors on a special package, which is the triple of the normal salary package in the central district. We have also recruited more than 50 emergency medical officers and a medical officer on a special package in which there is a great number of the lady doctors, women medical officers are there. We have also uh, recruited almost 481 nurses for the merge area in the secondary health service. In addition to that, the paramedical staff, 
the EPI staff and the LIWs are being recruited uh, in an accelerated implementation way uh, in, for the merge area. We are also uh, having a special package under AIP for provision of topping of their medicine in addition to their own budget and uh, supply of equipment. We have uh, provided more than 600 portable ultrasound for the uh, MNCH services and the staff has been trained whatever was available. The newly recruited staff is being trained. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a nutrition program in the area as well as in two districts we have ASAS National MA program. This is a special Prime Minister initiative for the uh, improving uh, antenatal, postnatal and natal services uh, linked with the, some monetary benefit and uh, immunizations and uh, supplementation of food. The secondary level hospitals are also outsourced or under public-private partnership. It's also a way for a good governance and uh, improving the quality of care. Six eight hospitals have already been uh, outsourced and another 10 hospitals have been approved by the provincial government for outsourcing. And uh, in the outsourced hospital analysis has been done and there is a lot of improvement in healthcare delivery system in that area but still this uh, outsourcing is done for the secondary level. The provincial government is also thinking over the outsourcing of some of the primary centers in some of the district with uh, an a, a, a excellent uh, contract management for provision of comprehensive primary health package in these area. Uh, we are also uh, trying to improve governance in that area uh, through our additional uh, Director General for the regions, as well as we have also in place now the IMU Independent Monitoring Unit for the uh, monitoring on some indicator like provision of HR, availability of HR, regularity of HR, provision of essential medicine, and provision of provision and functionality of the essential equipment in all level of hospital from the primary to secondary and We are also making some linkages to the tertiary hospital which are situated on the uh, nearest places like for North and South Uziristan. We have a tertiary hospital of Diyai Khan, then in Bannu, then uh, in Kohat we have a tertiary hospital, then for the Momand and Khaybar, we have the Peshawar Hospital, or Bajor, that can also be linked to the Mardan and to the Sawat. So they are, are, but still, I can say that practically speaking, the referral mechanism between primary and from community to the primary and primary to secondary and secondary to tertiary is a practically not existing. Within Within our resources, we are trying to improve it uh, and we are making some primitive uh, mechanism for referral, but still that is a big query and it's a big challenge. Uh, recommended by Dr. Zalko, my experience in other countries, we appreciate that, but in Pakistan, especially in the Maj area, we have three important challenges in this. So I'll be having three important questions to our Honorable Dr. Saab the experience in, in implementing this in the uh, similar areas of other countries. The most one important question is that availability of network in all the areas. As Dr. Ghazna has mentioned, the difficult terrain is a difficult to access. There is a less accessibility of the different mobile services. We tried to make the Android app for the EPI staff, but still we have not uh, uh, able to achieve that due to non-availability of service for outreach as we, we are having this in the central district and we were replicating uh, regarding the outreach activity and polygon coverage in the mud district, but still we are unable to do because every place is not accessible in the right. The second important question 
everyone know and Dr. Rana has also mentioned that the culturally and uh, norms of the society are like this that uh, if uh, uh, the cross messaging or bio manual messaging or two way messaging from the health facility to the woman sitting in a very remote area in a house, wife. So this is also a cultural restriction. The third thing is the education of the woman. So they are not able to use this type of uh, services, able to write, able to read. So these three, four important challenges in which how uh, this is by asked by question from uh, experts that how can we overcome this type of challenges in current scenario of the mud area. I'm again uh, thankful to all the participants, especially Dr. Ratko and Dr. Ghazna for their time and their valuable presentation. Uh, we uh, Health Department Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Provincial Government Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, even the Federal Government Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is very much interested and very much keen and also worried about the quality of services and has taken a lot of steps with a lot of financial input, a lot of governance input. But still we are far behind and we have to go a long way forward. Uh, hopefully, in some day we will be able to achieve all that. Uh, the steps are better. We are in a good way. We, our initiative are good. So one day we will be able to make it at least at bar with the central district of the KP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Thank you so much. Uh, we will... Uh... Yeah, um, Zadko, would you like to answer uh, the DG's questions? Yeah, um, those, these are very valid questions. Um, and obviously difficult questions and challenging questions. Um, when it comes to the cultural and social norms, I mean, these are um, barriers which are very difficult to address and the most kind of entrenched barriers because it's very difficult to change, change people's culture. So we need to work around it rather than to change it. So this is what I presented that slide on the importance of involving community healthcare workers in directly engaging with the community. So, you know, the sort of a standard traditional door to door um, uh, visits where, you know, community healthcare workers will uh, could potentially spread the, the health literacy word and the importance of using antenatal care and skilled birth assistance as well. Involving the whole household, obviously, is quite important. Uh, uh, and again, uh, in this kind of challenging um, in cultural, logical, anthropological sort of settings, um, sort of involvement of community healthcare workers, I think it's quite needed. And I think this is what also stems from um, from the literature that we've covered on this ground. Um, education of, uh, of uh, females is actually quite important, but obviously we can't tackle this overnight and we can't tackle this in a period of a year. I mean, this is more of a sort of a longer term um, issue. Um, so, uh, again, we have to look at this holistic, in a sense, work with other departments, not necessarily just health department, but also education, social protection, pass the net wider and um, uh, cooperate between different uh, ministries in order to, um, you know, slowly enroll more girls into the education system. And once they become women, they'll be obviously a bit more aware of the importance of the use of health care. So, so, so again, this goes hand in hand with all of these efforts that I'm sure the the wider government in Pakistan and the government in the in the merged uh, uh, region um, is actually uh, um, doing towards meeting the various sustainable development goals, including the sustainable development goal four, which is specifically targeting education. So that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Slatko. Um, I think we're going to take uh, a question uh, from uh, our audience, uh, the attendees. Okay. Uh, the question is for you, Dr. Zlatko. 
Uh, what is the question? Okay. Uh, the question is from Hasnan Ahmed Nazir. Uh, yeah. He's asking, why are we limiting the IT only mm. to the SMS? Why not look for other options like developing a user-friendly app that is yeah. used by uh, LHWs, Lady Health Workers, and it keeps a record with the authorities as well about the cases handled? Yeah, this is a valid question and I mean, we're not limiting ourselves to the use of SMS, it's just the literature that has emerged in this area is uh, uh, has mostly relied on SMS because the papers uh, uh, were done in 2010, 2011, 12, where the, the use of uh, the smartphones was not um, as wide as, as it is now. But as the penetration of the smartphones is increasing, including in low and middle income countries, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, in addition to uh, SMS uh, or text messaging, the use of apps uh, could actually be a good way forward. And yes, we are not limiting ourselves by, by no means. It's just, as I said, uh, uh, the papers that, were, that have been published in this area have relied on those. But I'm sure that is as, as this, as I said, this is a quite new, quite burgeoning area. And as there are new papers coming up, I'm sure that we can see the use of these additional um, uh, sort of smartphones, uh, gadgets, apps uh, in in, in uh, improving health literacy and uh, circumnavigating around the fractured referral system as well. Thank I don't you. Know if, uh, I don't know if Dr. Hasna is online and whether she needs to add a bit more on this. I can't see her. But uh... Uh, Dr. Hasna uh, actually had to leave uh, exactly at 5 p.m. We've gone uh, five minutes uh, overtime. Uh, but I am so thankful to all of you, uh, to all of our experts, to Dr. Zlatko, to Dr. Hasna, to uh, the, uh, DG Saab, Dr. Niaz Muhammad, uh, and uh, to everyone who participated uh, in. Uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I would especially like to thank the Directorate of Health Services, KP, and the communication team at the Health Department of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa for allowing us to go live on their Facebook page. Uh, and a quick reminder, um, after the webinar ends, the survey that will pop up on your screens, please do fill that. Uh, your opinion is important to us and helps us uh, improve and, of course, uh, direct our uh, uh, towards uh, what uh, the issues that are important to you. Um, we will, of course, uh, be having a post up on uh, our social media pages. Uh, so do watch out for our emails and our social media for upcoming seminars in the series, the next of which will deal with the issue of electricity in the region. So another uh, important uh, issue uh, to uh, talk about. Uh, before I wrap up, I would like to apologize uh, for all of the unforeseen technical difficulties uh, we had to face today. And um, uh, it does happen in live sessions, uh, but uh, uh, we do apologize uh, for the inconvenience caused. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.